to another episode of Inside the Recording Studio. I am Jody Whitesides, and with me, as always, is Mr. Chris Halstrom. How are you today, Chris? Hi, Jody. I'm doing good. How are you? I'm doing good, too. Yeah? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. What do you got going on for today? You. <laughs> you and this podcast. I feel so privileged. <laughs> yeah, that's it. All right. Well, that's good. That's yeah. fair enough. Maybe we should just dive into it then. Yeah, what and, are we talking uh, about? We are talking about ways to EQ acoustic guitar mm-hmm. when we're tracking them and some problem areas that that might garner a little bit more attention, perhaps, when it comes to that. So sure. We'll see. So you play and record a heck of a lot more acoustic guitars than I do. So I might lean on you a little bit more on this one. Lean but, on uh, me when you're not strong. Yeah. Yeah. Nicely done. <laughs> <All right. laughs> When we scheduled this and and prepared for this, there are, of course, stylistic differences here, but we are talking more like general guidelines now. This is not necessarily for, oh, this is just a pop or a big strummy type of thing, but we're thinking more wider terms, right? Is that how you're kind of approaching this, or am I reading too much into uh, where you'd like to take this? I was just thinking of what are the areas to look at when you're EQing and recording an acoustic guitar. And we're going to kind of keep it simple and looking at about five, four actual means of EQ and a fifth way to exit yourself out the room. (laughs) I guess I'm saying it. Well, fair enough. We're talking now at mixing stage and not during tracking because we we will touch on the tracking part. So start us off, man. What's the first thing that you... Assuming that everything has been recorded as well as possible, mm-hmm. and that's a big assumption, it I is. know. But in a perfect world, we, we've tracked guitar, the performance is good, but there's still some issues getting it to work in the mix the way you'd like. So wh- where do you start listening and what do you notice that there are generally problem areas? The low end first. Low end. The big bottom, as yeah. Spinal Tap might say. The way I would generally approach that – Regardless, especially if I'm not using some sort of frequency analyzer, I'm going to immediately throw a high pass filter on it. Generally, I'm going to start that around the 50 hertz area. And depending on which channel strip I'm actually using, whether it's a Neve or API, the Focusrite, SSL, what have you, each of them are going to have a slightly different curve to their high pass filter and how sharp it's going to take things out, so to speak. Generally speaking, I'm throwing that high pass filter on pretty much immediately so I can take out anything below 50. Well, it's just the rumble that kind of lives down there, right? That's just yeah. going to kind of clutter up. Along. So when you say the slope on the EQ there, how how aggressive are you? Do you tend to go for like a 12 dB or 18 dB slope type of thing? Or are you just kind of going with whatever the channel strip is. Or- well, if the channel strip has it built in, you either have to know the slope or you have to listen to it somehow to understand how much it's actually taking. Some are gentle, some are six, sure. some are 12 dB, or some might even be 18. Some are settable, but most of them, when they have the high and low pass filters, it's just they're a recreation of the channel strip itself. Somewhere in the brochure is going to tell you what the actual slope is, and it's not adjustable. But on modern right. EQs, if you're using the Ozone 9 EQ or the Dynamic EQ out of Ozone 9, or if you're going to pick up a Waves EQ of some sort, or Fab Filter, or name off Even some other stock, EQs, <laughs> yeah. or stock, your stock DAW filters, they usually have a settable slope. Right, But often now I'm using the emulated channel strips. So I'm just going with whatever they set their slope at, at their high and low pass filter. Generally speaking, I'm talking about the high pass filter and I'm starting it right around 50. If I feel like there's still too much low end rumble coming in, I'm going to bring it up further. Generally speaking, the furthest up that I would go with a high pass filter is somewhere around 160 at max. Because wow. at that point, you're starting to chew out quite a bit of stuff. But generally speaking, most acoustic guitars don't need to go that high in terms of the high pass filter. 
And things that we have to consider there, of course, is the, the type of arrangement. Is it a solo guitar, that type of thing, if you're yes. going that high? But, of course, if it's a really exposed guitar, like you said, if you start at like 50. That generally takes care of most of the problems. Right. There's not a whole lot, if any, of importance right there. And even if you end up going a little bit higher, if you have the option again, is to have a little bit more of a gentle slope perhaps, because Mm -hmm. then you might be – so let's say, for example, if you're going all the way up to 150 or 160 – with a steep slope, that's going to take away too much of your tone. Sure. So, but if you have issues going on, a gentler slope might work there as well. But So 50 is your starting point then anyway to kind of get rid of that extra rumble. Yep. A vast majority of the time, that's what it is. Right. Okay. Yeah. How about you? Makes sense. Yeah, I do the same thing. The way I tend to record guitars and have them sitting in my – songs that I do and songs that I tend to mix, the acoustic guitar is more often than not a supporting instrument. Mm. It's not the main thing where it might just be like a ballad or something. Right. So I can usually get a little bit more aggressive with it Mm -hmm. because it's not just a solo acoustic guitar. So if it takes away a little bit more of the low end just to make it sit in the mix a little bit better, I can do that. Mm -hmm. But depending on what's played, I wouldn't go much over a hundred if I can help it, you know, sure. th- then it's kind of drastic. Right? So, there was one point in time where I actually approached Taylor guitars about making me a seven string acoustic guitar. Yeah. Then the that would have probably changed things in terms <laughs> yeah. of how I would approach using the high pass filter. But unfortunately, or actually maybe more fortunately, I didn't get that guitar made, but there's always the future to think about. <laughs> yeah. But that is an important thing to keep in mind though. And I mean, this might garner another episode down the line, but thinking about EQ as it relates to pitch Mm -hmm. and how you might treat those, let's say those seven string guitars again, if you get down that low, you're you're going down really low in the frequency range with the fundamental of those tones. Yeah, especially with an acoustic, that would be pretty, pretty hardcore. Yeah, it is important to keep in mind when you go like, well, why can't I hear that open... B string now. Mm-hmm. Well, because you you high passed at 150. So <laughs> you're, losing you're effectively just notching it out. Yeah. yeah. So moving so on from our low end, where do we go next? Yeah. I say we go up the spectrum here and just start looking at the low mids. All right. When I'm thinking low mids, I'm thinking 100 to 300 kind of range right there. That's where I start. And what are you doing in there? I'm trying to clean up some mud or some crud or just stuff that just kind of makes it boomy, I mm-hmm. guess is a good word for it. It's, okay. uh, it can also be a little bit of that boxiness where it can hinder the tonality and the clarity of the low end if you're playing. Let's say, for example, if it's a part where you're strumming these big open chords perhaps and you can get a little bit muddy. It's cruddy. It's that range, right? <laughs> so, so the question is how, how sharp is your cue in there? Well – I'm going to ring the bell and say it's content dependent, but it depends on obviously how well the guitar has been recorded and on the part. If it's something where somebody is really, really hitting that low E or something, right? And there's a certain frequency that is just being popped and hit again, then I would get a little bit more aggressive. Mm -hmm. But generally, I try to try to be as gentle as possible because – if I have to cut out too much, chances are that it just hasn't been recorded properly. And also, it can affect how natural the instrument is going to sound, at least sure. to my ear. So if, if I get too aggressive there. But I would say probably gentler curves there, mm-hmm. unless there's an absolute issue with something where you know you have to notch it. The more extreme it would get, I guess I would use a narrower curve sure. to, to, to problem solve. What about you? I am going to concur with all that you have just said. Essentially with that area in the same, pretty much the same general area from about 100, maybe 300 up to possibly Mm 350-ish is really having to pay attention to the arrangement of what else is happening with the acoustic guitar. If it's all by itself and it's not ringing out in weird resonances, I probably don't touch it at all. 
But if sure, it's inside a fairly dense arrangement and other things are kind of getting in the same way with the kick, the bass, some sense, the piano, whatever it is that's riding along with the coattails of the acoustic guitar and what its importance is in the mix, I'm likely to be cutting there gently. Yeah. Usually with much more narrow notches, but yeah, same. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, the, the wider notches that you get there, you're again, you're removing tone, right? Mm -hmm. You're not, you're sculpting, you're not kind of making something nicer or taking care of problems that could be there. But here's also one of those things where like split EQ would be great. Yes. Where you can, you can just get the transient, right? And you massage that a little bit more and leave this sort of fundamental kind of attack or, or uh, intact. So, you know, again, depending on playing style or what's going on there, but, but that's a great tool for that type of stuff. Yeah, so oh, I agree. Right. And where do you go next? Let's move up the register here, shall we? <laughs> well, then we're talking about upper mids. We're talking into like the 800 hertz to the 2K range. And this is the quality area of the instrument is probably a good way to denote that range on the acoustic guitar. And generally speaking, a vast majority of really good acoustic guitars, this is where they are super abundant in their sonic juiciness, I guess would be a good way of saying it. I'm going to steal that sonic <laughs> juiciness. <laughs> Just start a new uh, juice bar with sonic juiciness and all you serve yeah. music. <laughs> Merch idea. Yeah. yeah. That's true because that's where, to my ear at least, that's where the clarity is. Mm -hmm. Right? It, it's not the weight. It's not. It's that mid-range where everything kind of lives. It's an area that can... And this probably depends on the instrument as well, less on perhaps the player, but the quality of the instrument where you can hear everything going on. Yep. I might be more likely to have gentle boosts here perhaps to bring out certain things if it calls for it, of course. But there, there can be issues here as well. But if I want to bring out a little bit more, let's say that this is a, a picked guitar part. Right. Yeah. I would listen for that to kind of get if I want that attack uh, prominent or not. That's where I would go. But generally speaking, you, if there's vocal going with this guitar, I'm going to watch out right in the 1.8 to 2K range of yeah. whether or not I'm going to scoop that guitar or not. Right in that little area with a just fairly to leave, narrow cue, just to leave room, leave room for the for vocal. The vocal. Yeah. But if there is no vocal, then that's where I'm going to likely take a narrow boost due to articulation of the pick hitting the strings in a sense. That's where right. you get a lot of that energy right there. And if it feels like it needs to be shifted because you do have a vocal, well, then I'm more likely to shift it a little further down into the 1K range right? to yeah. get that boost in there somewhere. That but when you say that you make room for the vocal or you say you might dip a little bit, how yep. much are you talking about there? You're only talking about a few dB, right? Yeah, two and a half max, one, yeah. one to two mostly in that range-ish area. It's kind of interesting how those seemingly minor – Little adjustments. adjustments can make uh, <laughs> a big difference. Yeah. Right? Everything's stepping all over themselves if, if you don't. So, But again, of course, you have to make the decision there. I mean, if it's a vocal, it's obviously the vocal is going to win every time, right? Because that's, Hopefully. <laughs> right. Well, assuming that that's the most important part, which it generally is. Sure. Right. Unless you're a guitar player, then of course the guitar is always the most important part. And, you know, this but, is why uh, guitar players generally don't sit in on the mix, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Where, where is all the guitar? I, I did a pick scrape here. Why, why, why can't I hear that? <laughs> so, <laughs> it was automated out. <laughs> yeah, because everybody's against me. But in all seriousness, that's an important range. So th there's clarity, that type of thing. So we have to use a little caution there, I think to make sure that it plays well with others. And with all that importance, let's take a word from our sponsors. And we're back. We're going to move on to the next level in our acoustic guitar EQ spectrum. 
what would that be? I'm thinking Sheen. Sheen. Nice. Not Charlie. <laughs> Not Charlie, but the acoustic guitar type of Sheen. Mm-hmm. And if we want it there or not, again, content dependent. But now I'm looking at higher up in the register. We're going up, I'm thinking maybe like two to four, maybe even 5K yeah. in that area. So how do you treat that? Because you do this, like I said, you do this a lot more than I do. What's your sort of mentality when you go in there and what are you listening for? Depending on how dense this arrangement is and how important I feel this acoustic guitar is in this arrangement, I will treat that area with a boost. And the Mm -hmm. reason for that is, is that you can get a good deal of esoteric volume level. Esoteric Again, volume another level. line, esoteric <laughs> volume level. All right. Well, you can give its perceived value a bit of a boost here without really bringing the volume really ridiculously loud. And by so boosting what you're saying that, is that range, you, you, you're making it more prominent and you hear it more without having to bring the fader up one or two dB. So you can have it sit and add a little bit more presence. Yes. Is that what you're, yeah. That's All right. probably a good way of saying it, which is better than saying esoteric volume, but <laughs> it is kind of esoteric volume. But You're esoteric bringing up volume is much better on the Scrabble board is yeah. <laughs> than, than, than presence. So The idea of it there is that when you bring it up in that area, you get a couple of things happening. You get a bit more of your attack signal, the shine on the attack, and you get a bit more of perceived volume without bringing out a substantial amount of weight, I guess is a good way of saying it. Yeah, it's certainly not going to define my thing, esoteric right? yeah. volume. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll play along. Yeah, I think that's right. But again, it, it depends on, for me at least, the way I would treat this is I think if you overdo this, this is one of those things where I think it was Dave Pensato that said once about this sort of frequency range. Like, that's the sound of expensive. You know? <laughs> that's but, a good way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, but have to be careful there. Somewhat, though, because once you start getting up into that, like, 5K range, I think if you get too aggressive, you start sounding just brittle. And you can potentially just add that sort of noise, really, Mm -hmm. to the instrument or the track. And also, depending on what the vocal is doing at that point, you know, in my opinion, the vocal always wins, right? So that's always in the driver's seat. So I'm careful in that range. It would really be a reason for me to do any kind of boost there. It's a sound of expensive, but be be careful because you can easily make it sound brittle and just piercing. And I think it's one of those things also where, you know, our guest Adam here a couple episodes ago were on and he was talking about taking breaks and things. Mm -hmm. If you don't at that range, that can easily start sounding, ooh, that sounds really exciting. That's really, really good. (laughs) And and then you come back and all the dogs in the neighborhood are just like, going rampant, right? Sure. So be careful there. But in that two to five K range, where is your yeah. most useful portion to you? Probably a little bit lower than the five. And, and I'm trying to stay out of the vocal than about two. So if I have to do something in that area, I might look at like three, mm-hmm. maybe. That would be my go-to range in there as well. The, yeah. the one okay. spot that I tend to be very wary of is about the 4.1 range. If there's explain a, yourself. Well, that's where a lot of harshness actually builds up for a lot of mm-hmm. instruments. So a narrow notch right there is generally a good idea. But for boosting for the clarity or the sake of getting some extra sheen, it's either three or if I'm really feeling avant garde, I might go to eight to yeah. get more of the air. Out of it. 8k yeah wow serious sheen. that's you're mad sir you're mad that's yeah no i would mad scientist. i would i don't do never it say drastically never. though right well you should never say never but i would say i would never go that high on acoustic guitar because to <laughs> me i was like yeah there, there's nothing good happening up there right so that now is- we're talking about you know i'm thinking at least when we're talking acoustic i'm thinking Steel string acoustic. Sure, that, that's how I'm. I'm kind of um, validating my 
my decisions here. My other what? assumption of going up that high uh -huh. has more to do with the actual recording and okay. the type of mic that was used to record that guitar. Some mics are going to do it much better than others. Now, yes. If it was done with an SM57, I'm mm -hmm. not likely to be boosting 8K. Right. However, if it's done with a KM184 or a C12 or a 260 or something and like that nature, where the high end is a lot more pleasant than brittle or aggressively shrill, shrill, or yes, piercing, <laughs> or yeah. so it's dependent upon what comes next in our little discussion here, which is if I have gotten to a point where all of this EQ for the low all the way up to the sheen has gotten radically aggressive in either boosts or cuts, I have to rethink, does this need to get re-recorded? Yes. I'm right with you there. It obviously is dependent on that. If you find yourself that you're if your EQ curve looks like it's an ad for an EQ. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, That's a good one. Never heard that yeah, before. It, it, well, I, it always strikes me. It's like, who EQs like that? You know, but if it looks like that, it's probably a problem with the recording. Sure. If possible, then take all the information that you're now armed with and, and perhaps rethink, if possible, the, the re-recording of, of the, the guitar, right? Could be mic placement, all of those things. Could be that we've room placement. I mean, where you sat the guy in the room to actually play the thing and then you put the mic up against it, that kind of thing also creates an issue. Sure. That's, that's yeah. the Al Schmidt method. Make sure that yeah. shit sounds good right in front of the mic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, as we're talking about sort of stepping away from now, but, but the high end or the high mids, I think, and I'm, I'm repeating myself or I know, but I'm thinking, the better the quality of the instrument, uh -huh. you're perhaps less likely to have an issue in those areas. Sure. Because Same could be said a, for the mic that's actually miking the darn thing. Oh, of course. Yeah, all of these things work together. But let's say that if you're using a mic that might, even if it's not like a 57, but something that can be seen like a little bit more of a duller sounding mic, mm -hmm. you can perhaps get away with boosting a little bit in that area. If you want to bring out a little bit more clarity, then it's really a matter of poor mic choice perhaps yep. when, when, we're, when we're tracking. But of course, again, devil's advocate, if you only have one mic, that's the mic that you have to use, right? The best mic is to use is the one that's in your hand, right? So you go. <laughs> if it's your only you choice, go, yes. Yeah, it goes with that. But besides the EQ ranges here and what we talked about, the, the guidelines that we tend to think about here, mm -hmm. how much of this changes for you if it's instead of a picked part, if it's like a finger style type of part, do you find that it's pretty similar or does it change how you think about it, because, you, you know, the transients will obviously be different. It's still a generality. So it becomes that phrase that we like to use, program dependent. Even if I'm using a finger picked portion or part, I'm thinking in terms of do I need the finger striking the string to be more articulate or not? And that's still going to happen in the sheen area of the 2K to 5K right. range. If I want more air out of the situation, I'm still going to go up towards that 8K range. If I need to think about the body of what's happening. Now, there's a difference between how a pick is going to attack the string and a finger is going to attack the string. And that's going to affect that 8 to 2K range of the upper mids. Because the finger striking the string is going to have generally a much more dense reaction with the string. Mm. It's going to give it yeah. more meat, so to speak, because you're using more meat <laughs> to attack, <laughs> to excite the string, to make it sound. So it does come a bit program dependent. Those general areas are still the focus points of the acoustic guitar sound when you're EQing it for a mix. Yeah, you start looking at those ranges immediately if you hear these these issues that might arise, and that's your go-to, and then tweak from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I guess the the thing with pick versus fingers type of thing that might also be instead of an EQ fix might be something that you you just deal with 
any compression differently, but that's not the scope here, right? right. But that might be a, a different tool for that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. All right. So there you have it. Those are the ways go. you want to start looking at EQing your acoustic guitar when you're getting ready for your mix of your next big hit of acoustic guitar material. And Sounds that, good. Yes. And with that, we're going to move on to our Friday finds. Chris, what have you got this week? Well, it's been out for a little bit if you're listening at the time of, of this episode being released. But I have played around with Heaviosity's Foundation Piano. Mm. They actually released a free piano. And in true Heaviosity fashion, it is awesome because I like <laughs> Heaviosity and everything about Heaviosity. But it is cool. It is more than just a sort of gentle piano. It has some bells and whistles in there. It's got some cool arpeggiators and rhythmic gating that you can do with it. And I thought it was really cool. I just came up with an idea immediately when I loaded it. And to me, when inspiration strikes, when you're just kind of loading it in, that's a cool instrument. And in this case, at least for the time being, it's free. Go check it out. Foundations Piano by Heaviosity is my Friday find for this week. Yay, free. Yay, free. Yay, good and free. <laughs> What about you? What do you got for us, Jody? I'm going to take it back to 1985-ish with a movie called Crossroads starring Ralph mm. Macchio. Yesterday, nice. I went down the rabbit hole and found the clip of the what they call cutting heads duel between the devil's guitar player in the movie, which is played by Steve Vai and Ralph Macchio. It's always fun to watch that just for the sheer sake of like fun guitar playing. Is a good way yeah, of saying just it. guitar nerdism. So I think that sparked a lot of new guitar players. Yep. Yes. In watching that and in knowing some of the history behind it, I've always been under the impression that Steve Vai had played his parts and apparently Ry Cooter played Ralph Macchio's parts. But in going That's down the understood. rabbit hole, <laughs> I learned that that is not necessarily true. <laughs> Ooh. And while the clip that I sent you has the epic, epic, epic comment war going on on it about who's <laughs> right and who's wrong, what I did learn actually is that Arlen Roth, who is a fantastic guitar player who back in the day created something called Hot Licks. It was one of the progenitors of that. He was the primary guitar player and music supervisor, music writer for the guitar in that movie, like of all the guitar stuff. And there is some interesting stuff that goes on behind the scenes with all of that in that the classical guitar portions of that movie were actually done by, I'm probably going to butcher this name, but Bill Kanegeiser or Kanegeiser. I've looked him up and watch some of his stuff on YouTube. The dude is a phenomenal classical guitar player. And having spent a little time being a, my first early years of formative guitar playing as a classical guitar player, it's fun to watch that guy play. He's really good. And it makes sense in the context of the movie that he was brought in to do that stuff. And then there's the whole fight of everybody thinking that Ry Cooter did all of these slide guitar licks and everything. And the general reality is, is that that is not necessarily true. Ry Cooter did have a hand in writing and creating some of that stuff. And then Steve Vai did have some hand in creating some of the stuff that he played. But a vast majority of this was all done by Arlen Roth. So it's just interesting they bring in four guitar players to do all of this stuff. And then the other thing that's fun about the rabbit hole is that there is an original take to that cutting heads duel. That didn't even That's involve cool. Steve Vai. It involved Ry Cooter going up against Ralph Macchio, so to speak, in the movie. But they cut that and put it on the cutting room floor and then brought in Vai to do something a little bit more probably entertaining. Because I really don't know how entertaining Ry Cooter is to watch. All right. So that is my Friday find. That, um, yeah, it's a little bit of history rent, there. because rent that Yeah, because I had to plead ignorance because I, like so many other people, thought it was... 
Rykuter and Vi that did that. So I'm going to enjoy checking that out because you did send that to me. So. Mm-hmm. While we've got your attention, we ask that you go to InsideTheRecordingStudio.com and sign up for our mailing list. Doing so will get you weekly reminders about the Tuesday tips when they come out, and we'll make sure that you don't miss any future episodes of the podcast. Send us an email at goldstar, G-O-L-D-S-T-A-R, at InsideTheRecordingStudio.com with the word acoustic and you'll get something cool back in your inbox. If you have a topic or suggestion for Chris and I to explain in a future episode, contact us at the contact page, and we'll put it into consideration for a future episode. And with that, I'll say, see you next week. Have a good one, Jody. Thanks for listening, everybody. 